Okay, so to my online audience, um, I'm Eric Ingheim. Um, so welcome to this talk about RISC-V microprocessors. So I just talked about uh, the word here, genius. So it doesn't mean quantum mechanics or theory relativity or that kind of smarts. There's nothing, in RISC-V there isn't anything that's fundamentally new and super clever. So this is more about the kind of things when you, you look at a small piece of code and you think, maybe it doesn't do anything revolutionary or new, but you're thinking, wow, that's kind of a very clever or smart way of doing this thing. It's a very neat way of doing it. And that's a lot of what I feel when um, looking at how RISC-V has been put together. It's a lot of existing ideas that exist, but they've been put together in, in a kind of a clever way, a smart way that sort of um, can be impressive. <clears throat> So this is the uh, RISC-V logo. RISC-V actually started sort of its, its life in a way began with RISC-1, which was the first RISC processor design at Berkeley. So a name that you will see pop up in this context is David Patterson, who was the guy that kind of wrote one of the better known um, papers that was arguing for why RISC or reduced instruction set computing was um, or reduced instructions at computer, sorry. Uh, it was a good idea. Um, so this went through several generations. You had RISC-2, RISC-3, and so on. And the MIPS processor used by Silicon Graphics is kind of a derivative of these first RISC processors from Berkeley. So RISC-V is really a, just a continuation of that, uh, that lineage. Uh, but it kind of, it popped up in relation to we're seeing that um, we're getting more and more use of heterogeneous computing. So you have using more and more specialized hardware. And for specialized hardware, you don't necessarily need the kind of a full instruction set that you would want on the regular microprocessor. So they wanted something that was um, more adapted to this kind of changing um, world. And they were, they were really just mainly doing it within academia. But then they started seeing that uh, people from industry um, showed interest for this architecture, um, and and, got, and so the so the Risk Five Foundation got started, um, which included members from industry, and that you got more of that kind of industry focus. <clears throat> so Risk Five um, is often presented as a kind of the Linux of microprocessors. And I think that that is not a really a fortunate way of presenting RISC-V. Uh, when I first heard about RISC-V, I actually wasn't very interested in it, particularly because it was presented this way, because it seemed like it was just like, it was just like any other microprocessor, except that it was an, um, a free or open standard. Um, so I prefer to not uh, think about RISC-V in this way. I think what really makes RISC-V different is that it's a a modular design. So unlike um, Intel and x86 ARM, these, these are based on incremental instructions. You're adding instructions, but you're getting one monolithic um, architecture to deal with. RISC-V is instead based on composable extensions. So I have a little bit of a sort of silly analogy here with incremental instruction sets. Uh, as you find with Intel and ARM. So they're a bit like um, a buffet. So you start, 1978, you start with about 18, 80 instructions um, for x86. Uh, and then as you go, you might want to have more things on your buffet. You want to have fries, you want to have Coke, and so on. The problem with this approach is the cost of the buffet goes up, right? Because you, you pay the same regardless of what you're actually, even if you just want the apple pie, you have to pay for the whole buffet. Um, <clears throat> so you keep adding, but you're never removing. And, and that has a cost, uh, not in dollars, but in, in number of instructions in silicon and so on. So if you look at uh, Intel x86, the 32-bit version, that's about 1,300 instructions. Um, if you look at the 64-bit version, that's about 1,500 instructions. It depends a little bit on how you count. So that's about three instructions per month. Uh, and isn't actually that much better with ARM. Uh, 
32-bit uh, ARM is around uh, 500 instructions. I also seen someone count it as seven. It's kind of hard sometimes to kind of agree on what exactly should count as an instruction. If you go to 64-bit ARM, that's about 1,000 instructions. Risk v in contrast, because it's modular, the basic instruction set that you have to implement, which is called RV32I. So RV32, that means 32-bit risk v and I stands for the integer um, extension, which is kind of the base instruction set. So that's about four instructions. You can read the whole specification for risk v in about six, six hours. You can compare with um, how long it would take to read the other specifications. So a modular instruction set, if we can sort of do the, the food <laughs> analogy here, it's more like a menu. Um, if you only want the Coke and the apple pie, you only pay for that. You only pay three and a half dollars. Or in sort of real terms, this is of course in terms of, of transistor usage. <clears throat> So how complex is this? I have this example here of a sheet of all the RISC five instructions. Let me see if I can find the sheet here. So this is kind of, you have the sheet and you have pretty much all the basic instructions. If you build a sort of general purpose operating system on top of it like Linux, you can run that off all the instructions that are here. So the part over here, that's the, um, that's the base instructions you got to support. So you can have compressed instructions, a kind of an optimization thing. Doesn't really add new things. Um, you have, oops, you have over, uh, it doesn't show so well. So here it's the add and divide instructions. Uh, and you can optional atomic instructions, useful for operating system. Um, and then you have the F and the D extension, which is floating point operations. So the complexity cost, and what's uh, interesting is that the cost of Making a chip is not linear with the amounts of transistors you have it on it. It's actually the square of the area that you have. So the cost grows quite quickly. So we can take an example and compare some simple uh, RISC V and ARM cores. So if you take the rockets, compare it to an, uh, Cortex A5. These are, are similar in terms of like cash um, and in terms of performance, clock frequency, all these kind of things. And you'll see that the, the RISC V version, it has a die site, which is about half of the ARM cortex. And that translates, if you're producing at the same volume, that means that you're paying one fourth the price. Now we shouldn't exaggerate this too much because as you make larger chips, so the, the things that go into modern PCs, there's so much extra added, um, like branch predictors, um, out of order execution logic, uh, large caches and so on, that kind of dwarfs the transistors you have to allocate for things like instruction decoding. So <clears throat> for larger chips, this doesn't matter as much. But when you're in the lower end, so when you're working with microcontrollers, you're going to be able to uh, get risk v chips that are significantly smaller than, um, than ARM chips, which means that it's, it's a very competitive design um, in the low end of the market but also for very specialized things, and we'll get to that later. Uh, <clears throat> so what are these risk five uh, extensions? So they're given a name from A to Z. Um, so what you see here, RV32IMAFD, that means that you have the integer um, base instruction sets, you have the, um, the M multiply and divide, you have A for atomic operations, you have F and D for, I guess, single and double precision floating point numbers. Um, <clears throat> because these are so common, these are kind of the instruction, the extensions you would want on a kind of regular general purpose uh, CPU. So the main processor in your computer, 
uh, we use an abbreviation G for all those uh, extensions. But if you're building a very simple microcontroller for a very particular task, you typically might only want the I and the D in instructions. So the way you can uh, work with this in practice is that we have what's called control status registers. It's about 4,096 uh, registers on the CPU. Uh, so these are not general purpose. You can use them for computations and so on. Um, you have special instructions like CS um, RRS where you can read from these registers and they give you information about the chip itself. So you can read off what extensions does my particular chip support and then you can select going to different code paths depending on kind of uh, special instructions that could maybe um, increase performance. Now even if you don't even if you don't choose specific code paths you could still run code written with instructions that you don't support because you have um, unsupported instructions get trapped. So it's sort of like you get an exception for those instructions and you can go, go to a kind of an instruction service routine in the operating system where you can have um, encoded the instructions or an emulation of those um, instructions you don't support. So that means that in, in practice it is possible to run software on a variety of risk five processors that don't have the same extensions supported. And it's important to note that extensions, once they've been ratified, they're frozen, so you're never going to add or remove instructions from an extension. If you screwed up when you designed the extension, you'll just have to make um, a new extension. So that's a benefit for backwards compatibility. If you've written code specifically for an extension, you know that's always going to work. So we can contrast this with x86 and ARM. Say that they decided, well, this is, sounds really cool. Um, we want to also be able to compete in making these small uh, microcontroller <laughs> chips. Um, could they then split up uh, their instruction set in, um, with these smaller extensions? And that would be, that would be difficult because of backwards compatibility because you don't have legacy software that's doing all these checks whether an extension is supported. Uh, operating systems haven't registered service routines for instructions that are not supported. Um, so we, we lacked the ecosystem, the tools, and kind of the conventions that are sort of developed around RISC-V to do the same thing. You could, of course, start doing it with the instructions you have now. So from now on, you add extensions, but when you have 1,500 instructions already, there isn't much value in having modular extensions after that. You're, you're already too big for it to really matter. <clears throat> so I talked about instruction set architecture, ISA. I uh, just want to clarify that. So if you, <clears throat> to, you know, a popular car analogy, we, um, uh, your interface of the car is your steering wheel, your gear shifts, um, and so on. Um, that's the instruction set architecture. So ARM x86 are examples of that. It decides what kind of software you can run. Whereas the microarchitecture, that's like your engine. That's, you know, each individual chips, you can have an, an Intel or an AMD that can run the same software, but internally they can be quite different. That, that gives different kinds of performance characteristics. So that is the, the microarchitecture. Now you wonder where is exactly RISC-V um, used today? Um, so you can get personal computers that are, they do make these kind of ATX cards, like you have the Hi5 Unmatched, but you can run Linux on. Um, you could also get uh, single board computers, kind of like the Raspberry Pi, similar kinds of performance characteristics and features. Or you could get things like the Arduino uh, form factor. So this is a Arduino compatible uh, RISC-V <laughs> board. Uh, another thing that I've seen seems very um, popular is this um, IoT, Internet of Things. So these are kind of like microcontrollers that are a bit more beefed up. You can see that this one has, uh, it's a 64-bit CPU, a dual core. It has a neural network processor and so on. Um, so the idea here is instead of like you're collecting um, data from these devices and you ship them to a powerful computer for further processing, you can do a lot of the processing on the device itself before uh, sending it further. The thing that I think is uh, most interesting with 
um, of the projects that I've seen with Risk Five is this one from Esperanto Technologies called ETSOC One. I think that stands for Supercomputer on a Chip. Um, this is kind of meant as competition to um, graphics cards. So if you you've seen the um, NVIDIA Hopper uh, architecture that they just released, H100, um, that they use for um, AI acceleration or, or neural networks and that kind of thing, machine learning. Um, that is a little bit by accident that graphics cards get used to that, right? They, they got more and more powerful over the years because they were used for computer games. Someone figured out, hey, we could try to use this for um, high performance computing or machine learning. Um, and so they have been, they've taken that design they had originally based for um, computer graphics and they made it more usable for, for the, those kinds of tasks. So I think the H100, it doesn't actually have a graphics output. It's mainly used for, for these kind of um, high performance computing tasks. But you still have the kind of legacy of that kind of graphics oriented um, hardware. So like a GPU is a very kind of specialized sort of core. Uh, with, with this design, what they're trying to do is, instead of like GPU cores, you have a lots of um, actual regular RISC-5 cores. So 1,088 cores called Minion cores. They're quite small. And they come with the vector processing units. So that allows you to... <clears throat> do a lot of vector processing because you have a lot of processors. And all this is orchestrated by these Maxim cores, which are more like a regular core that you can run something like um, Linux on, has a richer instruction set. Uh, so one of the advantages of, of this design is that it has very low watt usage. So that's a 20 watts or less than 20 watts per chip. Um, normally in a rack, you have to you have to have under 250 watts, so you can put a lot of these chips on, on one board. I think the NVIDIA graphics card has consumed something like 700 watts now, so there's this quite a big difference. Mm. So to clarify a little bit of the, the choices here, uh, we kind of live in a, in a time of transistor abundance, so it's a lot of question of like, how do we actually spend all the transistors that we have? So you could do the first case here, you can have a um, bunch of generic cores, or you can do like what you've seen with the, the M1 processor from Apple or the system on a chip from Apple, where you put regular cores and you put a lot of specialized things like uh, DSP unit, vector units, um, specialized hardware for encryption. The downside of this approach is, of course, that um, your specialized hardware for encryption isn't going to be useful when you're running your word processor. So you're kind of wasting those uh, transistors then. On the other hand, a lot of those generic tasks are already fast enough. There is no point in spending more um, transistors on them. So it's better maybe to spend more transistors on specialized tasks where we really have a performance demand. The other choice we face is do we want to have a few large cores with high performance per core? Or do we enhance many small cores with a lower performance per core? You can see this kind of choice uh, clearly if you compare, say, the Apple M1 and the, uh, <clears throat> the Esperanto chip. So they're not that different in number of transistors. But you can see that the Apple core has, has in total about 32 cores, which is very different from the um, 1,092 cores that you get in total for the Esperanto. So if you add, you have the 1,088 mini cores, and then you have four um, Maxian cores. So the question is, why are the M1 cores so much bigger? What are the trade-offs here? So the core size is dependent on the kind of the amount of features that you're adding to them. So if you look at the M1, it has very fast, large cores. And they're large because they have things like outer order execution engines, that lets you uh, run instructions out of order, but which might be more optimal, so it allows you to run more instructions in parallel in a superscalar architecture. You have more advanced branch prediction, larger caches, and so on and so forth. So 
the end result is that you get high single thread performance, but you can think about this as a bit like having a, a racer car. Uh, you have a few really fast cars. The, the Esperanto choice is a bit more like having lots of big, slow trucks. Um, the cores are small because we do simple in-order execution. We have small caches. Vector processing, while that sounds fa fancy, it doesn't really add that many transistors. It's not that difficult to implement vector processing if you're doing it on an in-order execution. If you're doing in a superscalar processor, vector processing would take a lot more um, transistors. Um, so this is more, if you can work with data in parallel, this is more optimal because it's sort of like you can, you can take your truck and you can pick up a lot of load each time. So you can do a lot in parallel. But if you need to get um, an instruction or a cargo from, from A to B as fast as possible, right? That's not the optimal way. But as long as you can work in parallel as you can with um, a lot of machine learning tasks, this is a better um, approach. So the benefit of this is that if you're going for the fast individual course, you have the problem as you're adding transistors, you get kind of into a sort of diminishing returns. It, it kind of flattens out the, the performance. You get much more linear increase in performance by just adding more um, cores. Of course, you can have problems with memory contention and so on that can uh, create their own problems. <clears throat> so all this is kind of part of this sort of system on a chip revolution that we're seeing now where instead of companies buying individual chips and putting them together um, on one physical board. They're buying intellectual property and putting that um, and, and creating a single design that they just send to a manufacturer, um, which can then make uh, a, <clears throat> a system with, with a lot of functionality on one silicon die. So one of the things that I want to talk about here has to do with um, assembly instructions in RISC-V, where I think there's a kind of like some clever choices. So I want to give a sort of a little crash course here in, in RISC-V assembly before we get into that. Um, one thing, if you want to play around with this, is you have the Cornell RISC-V simulator. It's a bit like a toy. You have 32 instructions, so you don't have the whole thing. But you can see... Uh, you have to see the registers, the, the content, you see memory down here and how it's executing. You have more serious simulators like Spike where you can, you know, you can compile a real program and, and, and run it. But this is kind of useful for experimentation. The program I'm going to go through is this counter program. You count, you count downwards from a value and you, you write the, the value that you're counting down into a memory location. So just a bit of an overview before I go through this. So all instructions, they have these abbreviations. Um, so you see for them, add I. The I at the end of a lot of assembly instructions stands for immediate. So that typically means that um, one of the arguments, like the one here, is embedded with instruction rather than being read from, say, somewhere in, in, in memory. Um, you see store word. So word is typically the size that you work on on the processor. If you have a 32-bit processor, it's, it's 32 bits. If it's 64 bits, it's 64 bits value, and so on. So in addition to the um, assembly codes that you have in, um, in RISC-V, you have, you have pseudo instructions, which are not real instructions. They're um, just kind of an alias for real instructions. So they it's often just used to kind of clarify our intent. So this is li load immediate. So it's just to kind of clarify that the ad I was using earlier is actually for really loading a value. So to understand assembly codes, you have to know about the concepts of registers. Um, so the idea is at the heart of a microprocessor, you have what's called the arithmetic logic units, ALU. Um, and it can do addition, subtraction, and shift operations. So it takes in uh, input values from what we call registers and gets out um, the result and store it in another register. So this thing with registers is actually kind of an old idea. Here on the left is a, an arithmometer. It's like an old-fashioned mechanical calculator, and it works exactly like an ALU. You can put in... You, you pull on these little levers to select digits, 
you get a number and you pull the crank on the side there uh, and you get um, a result down here in the accumulator register. It can also support shift operation by just pushing this whole thing back and forth. So if I push it one step, you multiply the result here by 10. If I push it two, you multiply by 100. Of course, in, a, um, in an arithmetic logic unit, because you're working with binary number system, we're going to, if we're shifting, we're, we're multiplying by 2, 4, 8, 16, and so on. And of course, in this one, you only have three registers. In a real microprocessor, you have a lot more. So risk 5 is very generous with uh, uh, registers. We have 32 registers. Uh, one of them is a bit special. Uh, X0 it is always 0. It doesn't matter what value you write to it or read from it. It's always going to be 0. It might seem a bit strange, but it's actually a very practical choice um, in microprocessors. In practice, when you're writing assembly code, um, you tend to use aliases to, to make it a bit more easier to keep track of what you're using your registers for. So the ones that are marked A0 to A, <coughs> A7, these are used to pass arguments to functions. So um, <clears throat> if I'm passing uh, three arguments to a function, then those arguments will be stored in A0 to A2, for instance. Uh, we have uh, the T uh, <clears throat> registers. These are for temporary registers. So uh, one benefit of using these is that we don't have to waste any kind of time on storing to uh, memory to preserve them because you don't have any guarantees in the conventions we're using that these will be um, preserved uh, between, <coughs> between function calls. There's some uh, special ones, like the RA register, that holds a return address. So functions, you, you uh, jumped into a subroutine to perform a, a function, uh, it's stored in the return address in RA register. Then you have the stack register and a bunch of other specialized things. So an assembly instruction, it looks basically like this. You have the, the first part, add, is the mnemonic. <clears throat> kind of to help you remember what is it for. Then you have... Three arguments, we call those operands in uh, assembly code. So the first operand is the destination register. That's where we store the result of our operation. And then S1 and S2 are the, uh, the first and the, the second uh, source register that we're using as inputs to our operation. Of course, in code uh, or in, in the ma machine, we're not actually storing text, but <clears throat> a 32-bit uh, encoding of the instruction. So the first part uh, here, the, um, the yellow, the upcode part, the first seven bits, um, uh, that's the, the upcode corresponds to the mnemonic. It's what you want to do, like add, subtract, multiply, and so on. Uh, the next five bits on the red part, RD, <clears throat> um, that uh, encodes the destination register. And there's also five bits for the RS2 and RS1, the, the source registers. Um, so why do we need uh, five bits? Is that obvious? So it's, you can choose between 32 different registers. So to, uh, to be able to encode those, uh, one of those 32 registers, you need five bits. So you could have Thousands of registers in principle in a microprocessor, that is, is not a problem in terms of transistors. The, what really limits it is kind of how much space have you set aside in your um, instruction to actually encode uh, one of these registers. So I'm going to go through a little bit of how you, um, a processor operates, how it performs instructions. Um, so this is a, a great simplification. Uh, you can think about this if you, you know, the first microprocessor was actually on a printed circuit board um, and you have these individual chips for different operations. So if you think about something like that, you can think the, the, the colorful arrows that I draw on here, these are kind of like your copper traces that connect the different functional units together with each other. And then the gray boxes are some kind of chips that do a particular operation 
So you can see the blue parts here is the data bus. And you have a lot of the different things are connected here. So to make sure that you don't have crashes, that you don't have different units that are sending signals at the same time, interfering with each other, uh, we use these red lines, the control lines, to come out of the decoder to toggle on or off different functional units. <clears throat> so on a risk processor, you typically it's been structured to uh, perform an operations in four steps, so four clock cycles. The, the first step is the fetch step. So in this case, we, we start with the decoder. It's, it toggles on the program counter that tells us where we are in the program. And it toggles on the memory. So it means uh, the data sent out of the program counter, uh, it can flows into the memory, select an address where we want to pick an instruction. And we also toggled on the instruction register so that the data in the memory uh, gets sent into the instruction register for uh, decoding, while the other parts are they're, they're toggled off. So we don't have data flowing into, for instance, the registers because they've been disabled. <clears throat> the next uh, part is to uh, decode. Um, so then we are enabling instruction registers so that it can sort of send its data into the decoder. And it figures out to so say we have in the add instruction, we're adding um, to registers. Uh, this one picks the decoder, it picks uh, with the control register, which two uh, registers do we want to select as inputs. Um, it tells the, the ALU that we want to do an addition as opposed to say um, a subtraction or a shift operation. And the third step, that's when we actually execute. So you see here in yellow, the data is flowing into your uh, ALU, you get a result out in the output register at the end. And the final step is when we uh, store the result. It's the write back step. So in this case, uh, we have what we call a multiplexer over here. Uh, and we select which one of the outputs. We could potentially use this to specify an address in memory, but we want to send this uh, as a result into the input, uh, into one of the registers. So that gives you a little bit of sense of what's happening in the processor. It's very, there's a very small steps that do a very little thing uh, each time. So if we go through our counter program, it's easier to see what's going on. Um, at i, it takes uh, x0 plus 1. So x0 is always 0. So that has the effect of uh, putting a 1 into the x2 register. And then on every uh, iteration here, we're looping over here multiple times. We take um, x1, which is our, our downward counter. Say we set that to 14 at the start, and we want to count downwards to 0. We subtract 1 each time, because we have a 1 in the x2 register. After we've done that, we take the result and we store it at memory location x0 plus 4. So that is the fourth memory location because x0 is always 0. So that's why, you know, you often need a 0 in these kind of calculations. So it's very handy to have a register that is guaranteed to be um, 0. <clears throat> and next, we're uh, keep looping um, as long as the counter is above 0. Um, so one of the reasons I, I loaded this uh, value into register was because we don't actually have a subtract immediate instruction. Uh, and the reason for that is that RISC-V tries to keep the instruction set pretty small, and you don't really need a subtract immediate because you can use um, add immediate with a negative, you add a negative value and you get the same results. Um, Normally, you would write a pseudo instruction instead of the add i, because when you're using x0, that can translate into a, a pseudo instruction that gives your intention um, a bit better. Because we, what we want to do is to load a 1, right? We don't want to think about it as, as adding. Uh, let me clarify a little bit how these different instructions, uh, if you don't use register, but you say you have an immediate value, the execution step will be a little bit different. So you can see here that earlier we had the data flowing in here, but now we're selecting the multiplexer to say, oh, we want to have the data coming in from here. So it's actually coming decoded from this register here to, to, to go in. Um, and then the stored word is also a little bit different. In the write back step, we're using the outputs that we got not to go into a register, but instead 
to go on the orange arrow there um, into uh, on the, the address bus to select a memory uh, location in memory so that the value of the X1 is sent into that address that we picked. So for more sophisticated processors, we have something called micro-operations. There was not shown in this example that we went through here. That adds a kind of an extra step. Instead of the decoder toggling all these control lines, what happens is the decoder turns uh, an instruction into one or more micro-operations. So micro-operations, they do one thing. They happen in one clock cycle, one instruction, multiple micro-operations. Uh, and interestingly, even though they're called micro-operations, they're actually quite big. They're about 100 bits or something. And that's because they are micro-architecture specific. They contain um, basically all the control lines that you toggle on. They would typically be in some ways represented in the um, micro-operation. Of course, this depends on the um, micro-architecture. So um, an Intel chip and an AMD chip, while they use execute the same instructions, they may produce completely different uh, micro-instructions, <clears throat> micro-operations, sorry. So I like to kind of classify it as I would say the, uh, the instructions represent the interface to your microprocessor, whereas the micro-operations are really part of the implementation. A reason I, I stress this is because um, people have talked about that an x86 processor, it takes uh, CISC instructions in, and then it turns it into RISC instructions. But a, a micro-operation is not a RISC instruction. It um, has to do with implementation. So kind of a simplified diagram of how this works. Um, you can see that the micro-operations get to a control unit, which is, can then sort of toggle on the various control lines um, in the processor. So why do we need this? So one of the uh, reasons is we use what we call superscalar microprocessors. So the, the original design I showed you, you only had one decoder. Here you have multiple decoders. So you can de decode many instructions at the same time in parallel. And then you, you have this microoperations buffer. Um, this idea came out of the fact that when observed that in a modern microprocessor, you have many functional units. So you have the, um, we already seen the ALU, right? But as to, to get multiplication faster, instead of doing that in software, we can have a, a special multiplier in hardware. And we can have lots of different things. We can have floating point units. We have a special unit for doing just computing addresses and picking addresses in memory, the load store unit. <clears throat> and if you're just running one instruction at the same time, uh, all of these units are just sitting there idle while there might be instructions that aren't dependent on each other that can run in parallel. So that is where the, the sort of superscalar idea comes from. And with micro-operations, we, um, we can channel different um, micro-operations to different functional units so we can run things in parallel. So this takes us to um, ways of kind of uh, working with uh, these micro-operations uh, used in instructions, which is com instruction compression and micro-operation fusion. Uh, these are kind of tricks that um, evolved to make all this more efficient. So we can start with um, how did micro-operations come about? So it started with that CISC processors in the 90s started falling behind risk processors in terms of uh, performance. So the idea was like, how can we uh, compete with risk processor? Because risk processors were very well designed for doing things like uh, what we call pipelining. I can't really go through that here. Um, also, you know, superscalar and so on. No, not superscalar, but pipelining. Um, so by adopting micro-operations, um, a CISC processor can kind of get a sort of internals that look more risk-like and get a lot of those benefits. So you break down complex risk instructions into one or more micro-operations that are, for instance, better suited for pipelines. <clears throat> so in some ways, 
uh, for a period, and that gave um, Cisco processor the kind of the upper hand. And the reason for that is that with Cisco, like um, an x86, you have variable length instructions. You have one byte to 15 bytes long instructions, whereas on a RISC processor, you have four bytes um, long instructions, like fixed length instructions. The benefit of variable length is that you can have the frequently used instructions are very small, so you can use less uh, space. Um, um, <clears throat> and by uh, creating these micro operations, you kind of remove the overhead of these uh, complex uh, instructions. So with this approach, uh, you benefit. You had more benefits for cache. You can have uh, smaller caches, or you can fit more things into your cache because uh, sys constructions are kind of uh, more compressed. So what would a risk processor do as a counter move? Well, they came out with uh, compressed instructions. So a thumb, a thumb instruction set is kind of one example in ARM that is a compressed instruction set. Um, so the idea here is that you take you analyze your program, how it's being used, and you take the most common operations, a small subset, and you make compressed 16-bit versions of those. And by compressed, we don't need something, we don't mean something like zip or something that, that would be, it's, it's very simple to decompress these, it's about 400 logical gates like AND, OR, NAND, and so on, that you would need to, to decompress this. And it's just part of the decoder itself. And when you do that, for the rest of the processor, it just looks like regular 32-bit instructions that already exist. So it's kind of, it doesn't add any more instructions, and uh, it doesn't add any more complexity in the rest of the architecture. The flip side of this, um, which looks a bit counterintuitive, is something called macro operation fusion. So it almost looks like we're taking simple risk-like instructions in, and then we're spitting out a complex uh, CISC-like instructions or, or macro operations. It's, it's not quite like that. It's about finding a kind of a balance of having instructions that are not too simple and not too complex. If you have a too complex instruction, you cannot fit it within the sort of the uh, standard, say, four clock cycles or whatever clock, number of clock cycles you would have in your uh, CPU. Mm -hmm. If you have two simple ones, you're kind of wasting uh, CPU cycles without getting all that much done. <clears throat> so it's a kind of um, trying to fit as much work as possible within sort of the maximum complexity that you can deal with. So it's actually <clears throat> Intel, I think, was one of the first that started uh, doing this. So even though they had split up their um, instructions into simpler things, then they would merge them into more um, complex things um, afterwards. So Risk Five is kind of coming up with a kind of a, a if you combine these two concepts, you get a sort of a, a smart system. So you imagine that you have actually five instructions that are coming in from your instruction queue. So we have one uncompressed instruction, uh, two a compressed, and two compressed there. So you have a total of five instructions. Then these get decompressed, so you're getting um, five regular instructions coming out. Then you do a macro operation fusion, and you get three uh, macro operations out, and these get decoded, and you, you get uh, three micro operations. So the benefit of this is that, seen from the memory side, you only have to deal with something that looks like it, it consumes um, the, the same size of memory as three instructions. And in terms of the execution side, you're only spending the resources needed to execute three instructions. So you're getting uh, five instructions for the price um, of three. So to look at a bit more sort of concrete example of this, um, here's an example of a very simple um, operation. Uh, just get an element in an array. This is used as an, has been used kind of a, as an example, a bit of a criticism of RISC-V that they have simple instructions and also to, to point out some of the benefits, say, of an uh, ARM architecture that has more complex instructions available. Um, <clears throat> So this would look like this in Intel x86. I'm not going to focus so much uh, on that one. I'm going to talk about the ARM one. So LDR load uh, register. It loads a value from memory into the x0 register here. And the address that you're loading from is calculated uh, by 
Well, I got to clarify here that um, when you're passing these over, then on ARM architecture, then array will be put in X0, the I will be put in X1, and so on. So we're taking um, <clears throat> the uh, the content of the X, um, X1 register, <laughs> and you're doing a left, the LSL stands for left shift logical, or logical shift left, um, by two. So that's the equivalent of multiplying by four the content of X1, and that's because we have four, uh, each, um, each element is four bytes. And then we're adding that to the base address, the array, which is in X0. So that is kind of a sort of pseudocode explanation of what that operation does. On risk five, uh, these are split into much simpler steps. So you have the shift uh, logical left immediate, the first instruction there, which um, multiplies by four, the, the I value. So the A1, that's the, the second argument when you're calling a function. And then you're adding that to the base adder. So array is in A0, that's the, the first, the register for the first argument to a function call. And then finally, we are taking that final address and we were supplying that to the load word. So we're ending up with four instructions. So that doesn't really look so great for uh, uh, risk five. Um, also like to point out that this is a, a pseudo instruction, the uh, return from uh, subroutine. It's actually this jump and link register. So it's explained over there what it does. It's, it takes the retur um, return address registers, uh, if you remember the, the X1 register, and puts it in the, the program counter so it has the effect of going back to the um, point in the program stored in RA. Um, <clears throat> one interesting observation here is that you see that there are, we only have two unique registers here uh, in both of these cases. So that gives an uh, opportunity to have compressed instructions because remember we have five bits per, um, five bits to represent a register. So if we have three registers, that would take 15 bits. There's no way you're going to fit 15 bit, uh, bits into a 16-bit um, instruction. Um, so we can use the compressed instructions that only use two um, <clears throat> operands. So they're just designated by putting a C in front. You have the compressed instructions. As an assembly writer, you don't... You don't actually have to write this yourself. The, uh, the assembler would be able to figure out which one it can compress and which one, one um, you don't have to. <clears throat> but this is just to make it explicit. So in this case, all those four instructions are going to take the exact same space in memory as these two ARM instructions. So that takes care of kind of the, uh, the problem of risk by taking more uh, memory. You still have the problem that you have four instructions you have to execute. <clears throat> To solve that, we would use macro operation fusion. So one of the rules to make uh, fusion work is that the destination register for an operation has to be the same. So these two operations, the add and the load word, they can be fused because they have the same destination um, register. And the reason for that is if you're, if you're combining operations into one operation, if it's having outputs of multiple registers, that becomes a mess to keep track of. But if they collaborate each other's results, um, it's much easier to, to fuse those. So if we do that, um, there is no instruction called uh, add load word that I made here. I'm just, this is just kind of like a pseudo code example. Um, just to illustrate, we, we end up with a macro operation that does, um, it adds um, A0, to, to A1 to compute um, the, the address that we're going to read from in memory. Now, we're still left with three instructions to execute, so it's not quite as good as uh, on ARM or x86. So the question is, could we do better? We can if we, uh, if we rearrange the register we're using, so, so we're using the same register in every case. So we're using T0, so the... the um, <clears throat> the result register. In this case, we can fuse all of the three first uh, instructions. 
So we kind of get this, uh, I just call the shift log logical uh, left immediate add a load word. And of course, that's basically you're taking, it's, it's a macro operation taking all these operations. This is a happening inside the uh, CPU, of course. So you're not seeing an instruction like that in, in, uh, in memory. And so that will do these operations. It's, it's shifting uh, by left the A1, so basically multiplying by four and adding to A0. That is exactly the same kind of thing that the ARM instruction LDR is doing. So basically we end up with two micro operations just like ARM, but we require 10 bytes rather than eight bytes for um, execution. So the question is, these are just a simple example. Does it pay off in practice? So there's a paper, uh, it's called, <laughs> it's a bit long at the bottom here, the renewed case for the reduced instruction set computer avoiding I say blow it with macro op fusion for risk five. <clears throat> so they've done a, uh, a number of tests here. Um, it's a little bit of a mix of different things here because the, the bars are, are both instruction counts and micro operations and macro operations. Um, so the most sensible here is to compare the, the macro operation and the micro operation, the, the count will be uh, the same basically. So you compare this one and this one, that's the, uh, that's the number of micro operations in an x86 program for each of these different programs that they're um, testing on. And you can compare that to um, using macro operations on, on RISC-V. So you can see that it actually um, manages to outcompete the um, x86 version on, on, on several of these uh, metrics. Uh, another thing to look at is uh, total number of bytes consumed, like from the instructions. And here you can see that with using the compressed instruction set, um, risk five is, I think it's pretty much every uh, example here, except one, I think, uh, they're using less memory. So despite being risk instructions, uh, <clears throat> you're able to have more compact programs. So if you put all of this together um, with the geometric mean, this isn't a, a perfect comparison because uh, they, while they can count the number of micro operations on x86, they couldn't do it on the Cortex A53 because it doesn't have a micro operation counter inside it. So they had to analyze the um, uh, the code and use kind of guesses where you would typically uh, how the operations would turn into micro operations. So it's a kind of um, estimate, but based on their estimates, uh, the risk five would actually end up with slightly fewer micro operations to perform than um, <clears throat> than the Cortex A53, the, the ARM processor. And it would clearly beat the um, the x86. So that is kind of showing that even though you're using a very simple instruction set uh, with the kind of the, the right kind of logic, the right kind of sort of microarchitecture, you can actually still uh, be competitive. Uh, <clears throat> so the strategy that uh, RISC-V is uh, following is that they're publishing um, particular patterns of assembly code that could be uh, are candidates for macro operation fusion. So the idea is that they give this to the ones that write compilers like GCC and um, uh, Clang, LVM, um, and so that those compilers are set up so that they output these uh, particular uh, patterns of assembly code instructions that a uh, RISC-V processor can then uh, do a macro operation fusion on. So they will be different for different um, RISC-V processors. They will be, have different capability there. But then, you know, depending on what setting you specify, it will get slightly different outputs to, to match what they're capable of doing. Okay. So uh, thank you. Um,
So yeah, if you want to follow me, I'm on um, Twitter there. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Yes. Thank you. Um, if, can we go back to your slide of the, the really nice one where you did all the fusion and compressing and decompressing? It was it's like a half dozen. Uh, this one? No, the, the overview one. Back, back two, I think it is. Um, uh, more back? Yeah. That one. Yeah. So um, when it comes to, uh, uh, previously you said that you could do a multiply and an add, and you could um, you could do them in parallel, uh, but you couldn't do two adds in par parallel. Mm -hmm. So I guess this 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 in, there's an assumption here that the uh, instructions that are in the queue could be parallelized for you to be able to get to compress it down and uh, when you finally do the decoding you only have to execute three of your uh, micro operations yeah so for instance if you compress so that you 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 basically recreate um, something like the um, the arm instruction uh, like the load uh, LDR that does the shifts on the ads and so on uh, you can basically compress into something like that which is you just basically need to have the hardware that would allow you to do exact same thing that that instruction um, does. So you can kind of just set up specialized hardware to kind of deal with with um, those cases. But certainly, um, if you take so you have these three micro operations, they could in in principle all run in parallel, but that only works if there are not dependencies between them. So you have to analyze that. Um, so that can be difficult. Um, so one thing they do is, uh, if you take, say, the M1 processor uh, or system on a chip, um, it decodes eight instructions at the same time, So and it builds up a very large buffer of uh, microcode. So it can kind of look uh, at multiple spots and kind of find, oh, this one and this one and this one can run in parallel, so I'm going to um, run these. So that's kind of... Um, so you can imagine that's quite complex in, in silicon to do so. You require a lot of transistors to um, uh, achieve that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> Sorry. Uh, you were talking about micro and micro operations as kind of that's how it is done. That's how they are doing it. But I was, I'm wondering, is it uh, specified in risk, uh, in the specification itself, uh, or is it something that just everyone is do <clears throat> everyone is doing uh, implicitly, or is it a module that if you do this, then you get you add one more letter to the end of the specification, which version of the risk you are supporting? Uh, so you're asking if everybody does. Uh, yeah, is it a specific? Uh, is it in the specification of the architecture of the? Uh, oh yeah, no, the, the, the specification really only gives the instructions you support, um, but it's more the, the stuff that goes around there, what the, the recommendations um, that they, well, they try to, I guess that they, they kind of try to design the instructions so that they are, um, it's more easy to make them it possible to do macro operation fusion. Um, and the other is just really working with compiler writers to, um, as a kind of active policy to kind of um, identify these patterns. So while they'd also do uh, macro operation fusion in say x86, and I think also ARM does, yeah, ARM also does macro fusion, a little bit of that. Uh, but it's not sort of like a, a key part of their strategy the, the way it is um, for RISC-V. Um, is there so many different uh, processes designed where you can add and to take away various different modules and instruction sets. As a as someone writing code, uh, do I have to specify a different set of compiler flags for each process that that you use, or is there some other way? Do it? Does it always compile? I think that if you're if you're working with sort of typically embedded kind of developments. Uh, you would uh, you would specify kind of the processor that you're working on, and it will have some number of of um, extensions. And this isn't software that you generally um, put a lot of places, right? It's very specific kinds of software. If you, um, my understanding is that for things that would typically be 
considered to be used on a regular computer, like say a Linux box or something like that, um, I think that the G instructions will likely be kind of the standard. So you don't have to think about the extensions. That's going to be, um, you can expect that there's a kind of standard set of uh, extensions for regular application programming. It's more when you're writing specialized software. So if you, you, you create a RISC-V chip that's in your, uh, your keyboard or your mouse, um, those would probably then be um, use a very smaller number of extensions and you would target that specifically for that architecture. Um, if you look at um, Godbolt, you can actually see when you're picking compilers there, you can see that you can choose different um, RISC-V architecture with different uh, extensions. Uh, so you can see how we would compile um, the same code and see kind of uh, different outputs.